Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show that will never reach its true potential. Kingdom Hearts 2 is the long-awaited fourth game in the Kingdom Hearts franchise, transforming into an over-the-top, non-stop action game perfect for the level 1 run. The rules are near identical to those used in the first game. Sora and all party members must remain at level 1 for the entirety of the playthrough. For this to even be possible, we'll be playing the final mix version of the game on the new Critical Mode, the highest difficulty and only difficulty where the ability EXP0 is available. EXP0, as you might be able to guess, prevents EXP gain while equipped. Additionally, since they would destroy the entire point of the run, all consumable stat-boosting items are banned. Otherwise, we are totally unrestricted to blatantly cheat however we please. And finally, as a bonus challenge, which is frankly just the thinly veiled main challenge, we'll be going for 100% completion of Jiminy's Journal, requiring us to conquer almost every task the game has to offer. Just about the only thing we won't be doing are the gummy ship missions, which aren't tracked by the journal and are entirely unaffected by character level. By the way, I should very much put in one final note that this run has so many different simultaneous objectives that I wibble wobbled everywhere on the map basically at random. Events are absolutely not covered in chronological order. If you see me wibble wobbling between levels 1 and 1, that's why. With the rule set, can you beat Kingdom Hearts 2 at level 1? Before getting to any real gameplay, we've got a few hours of tutorials to sit through, including a couple character building choices. One of these choices will give a starting buff to either Strength, Defense, or Magic. If you generally prefer dying, choose literally anything. Otherwise, throw the game in the trash. Recall that in Kingdom Hearts 1, Strength and Defense were functionally useless at level 1. By the late game, we'd be dealing and taking the absolute minimum amount of damage, but a single point in the magic stat was a comparatively gigantic buff. In Kingdom Hearts 2, the magic system has been completely reworked, with the magic stat now joining strength and defense in useless solidarity. Your choice here will only affect the run in a completely inconsequential way a couple hundred hours later, which I'll get around to explaining in about 46 minutes. You may as well just pick whatever weapon looks cool so you can leave a pretty corpse. The later choice and the dive to the heart will determine your stat boosts on level up, so make sure you sit and think for a good couple hours before committing. As for getting EXP0 active, just make sure you get it done after the first battle in the Dive to the Heart. While there are some required battles beforehand, they won't give enough XP to level anybody up, so no fancy XP dodging shenanigans this time. Now you can start punching everybody you see, secure in the fact it will only make you a better person figuratively, not literally. While you're in those menus, you should also go ahead and equip all the abilities you can get your hands on. Critical Mode gives you a bunch to play with right at the start of the game, and more abilities will unlock gradually as you progress. Eventually, you'll reach a point where there isn't enough AP to go around, and you'll have to decide which abilities you'll be bringing with you and which you'll be leaving behind. To keep things brief, I won't be explaining how I min-max my abilities in every battle throughout the game. I trust you to experiment and figure out which abilities you like, which abilities you can live without, and which abilities are actively murdering you. Speaking of abilities, make sure you go all out and grind up money during the Watermelon Quest. You'll get a permanent direct bonus to your base AP based on how much money you grab, with the max of 2 AP being given if you collect a certain amount. I say a certain amount because the internet refuses to give a consistent answer. All I can say is I had 1,250 money and that was apparently enough. Once Sora eats Roxas, you can move through the game's worlds at whatever pace and in whatever order you please we'll actually start to feel the effects of our low level pretty quickly, and in fact, the early game is probably going to be harder on you than the late game. Later worlds will notice you're underleveled and invisibly balance your stats, so the major difference between an early world and a later world is your own lack of combat abilities, which must be earned through progression. 
you'll need to make smart use of all the resources at your disposal until you can get something better. You won't have cure for a while, so while this is normally illegal, you'll be forced against your will to substitute with potions. Blizzard is nearly completely useless in casual play, but is one of the earliest spells you learn, offering long-range piercing damage, perfect for attacking enemies not stunned by your basic attacks. And since magic now recharges itself, you effectively have an infinite supply and can win some battles with cheesy baby strats. Brave form, in addition to giving a huge offensive buff, should be used liberally. Every time you hit something while in brave form, you get experience points, allowing you to level up. And if a particular fight is giving you trouble, never forget that... Uh, oh, oh uh, wait a second. My magical mind-reading powers are telling me that some viewers are confused why we're gaining experience points to level up in a level 1 run. Each of Sora's forms has their own level entirely separate from Sora's character level. The experience points for each of these forms are ignored by EXP0 and function differently than usual. For example, Brave Form, as mentioned, gains 1 EXP per successful hit landed on an enemy. These form levels, very importantly, grant Sora with almost all his basic movement options. For example, Brave Forms is high jump, increasing Sora's maximum jump height. In addition to simply obtaining these abilities, as the form levels up, that ability will level up, increasing its speed or distance. While none of these abilities are required to beat the game, and it would certainly be a neat challenge all its own to do an any percent no form run, that's not our goal here. Remember, the main challenge is the bonus challenge to complete Jiminy's journal. These abilities are explicitly required to complete the journal, and for reasons you'll find out in about 44 minutes and 10 seconds are even double required to complete the journal while at level 1. I understand it's not going to be satisfying to some purists, which is totally valid, and it definitely feels weirdish that leveling up is a strategy in a level 1 challenge, but since the in-game level 1 button allows form levels, they mechanically function completely differently from normal level ups, and the super fun, super hard parts of the challenge don't even exist without them, I'm gonna be form leveling my friggin' heart out. And if a particular fight is giving you trouble, never forget that winning is not necessarily the win condition. As an example, in the canyon in Land of Dragons, beating all the enemies by the rock walls proved to be more than I could handle, particularly due to the assault rider protecting the third wall. To cheese past, I entered Brave Form, which automatically juggles nearby enemies, threw him a meter away, broke through the wall, and ran away before he could catch up. And for fights that don't let you sneak past, I've got super good news. Mickey Mouse himself knows you suck. During certain boss fights along the main story path, whenever you die a painful death, there's a random chance that Mickey Mouse will ninja his way onto the field. If this occurs, even if Mickey immediately sucks and dies, he'll revive Sora before his retreat, effectively acting as an extra life. And even if Sora immediately continues the suck and death combo, Mickey still has a random chance to turn around and jump back in. There have been instances where Mickey revived me five times in a single battle, essentially beating the entire thing for me. When actually fighting bosses with Sora, your basic attacks suck and are lame. Instead, you can deal tons of damage by using party member limits. These can be used as long as you have at least one MP, use up the entirety of your remaining MP, and most importantly, grant you immortality for the duration. Whenever you're having trouble, abusing limits is almost always the answer. And remember, just like with standard magic, if you're patient, you effectively have infinite ammo. If the arena gives enough breathing room, sit back, let your friends get roasted to death, run in to let a limit loose, and retreat to repeat the whole process. Once you unlock the tournaments in the underworld, you'll have a free, infinitely repeatable method of restoring drive to full. Simply enter the Pain and Panic Cup where the drive gauge is banned, exit, and voila! Apparently, the game is too lazy to remember what your drive gauge was beforehand and just refills it to the top. If you're in a rush or the Coliseum is unavailable, you can also refill to full by entering an area where party members are disallowed while the drive gauge is in use, such as the map screen. As soon as you get back on land, you'll be untransformed with the gauge totally full. By the way, while you're running around, you might come across these ominous floating orbs. Don't touch them.
That finally covers most of the general basics. From here on, we'll be tackling each individual battle one by one. In Disney Castle, you'll temporarily have access to the most overpowered party member in the franchise, Minnie Mouse. Her reaction command casts Holy, requiring absolutely no resources and dealing a big chunk of damage to every enemy in the immediate area. She'll single-handedly escort you into Timeless River, which itself features multiple difficult battles one after another. In building a building, absolutely the only way to deal good damage is with the mid-air reaction command. Try to lure all the enemies close together and spam the reaction once launched. Against the Minute Bombs in particular, watch for timers to sprout over their heads and mash triangle. Once they reach 3 seconds, a reaction command will become available which kills them instantly. In Mickey's Orphans, the Rapid Thrusters have a reaction command similar to the prior mid-air reaction, which should clear out everybody relatively easily. In Gulliver Mickey, the tower reaction can be spammed freely and stuns all enemies in the area, making it the easiest of the four battles. Finally, in Mickey's Fire Brigade, I was having trouble beating the super dangerous Hot Rods until eventually accidentally selling Sora's soul. When doing a Magical Girl transformation, there's a semi-random chance that you'll abandon the power of friendship and embrace the power of darkness with Antiform. Antiform is normally a death sentence, but its attacks are capable of juggling standard enemies for ludicrous amounts of time and while dealing ludicrous amounts of damage. With a properly timed accidental anti, I was able to juggle the Hot Rods to death without allowing them to enter their second phase, thus robbing them of all danger. Beating Timeless River gives you Wisdom Form, which, when leveled by killing Heartless, grants Air Slide, Kingdom Hearts 2's equivalent of Dodge Roll. Additionally, Donald will learn Fantasia, a limit usually overshadowed by those of world-specific party members, but one that will see a decent amount of use until Donald learns something ducker. In Port Royal, when using the ship to travel between locations, you'll encounter random pirate attacks. Though you may be tempted to swashbuckle, swashbuckling is only a valid strategy if you're good at video games. Otherwise, run away like a little pirate baby and hide in the cabin in a fetal position. This technique is so powerful, all the pirates outside will flee in terror, winning the battle in quotation marks and letting you continue to your destination unimpeded. Pirate battles specifically encountered during the story, however, still need to be beaten legit. And by legit, I mean by cheating. Head up to the steering wheel, that's what it's called, fight me boat nerds, and stick around the left side. The pirates earn no points for spatial awareness and will be nearly incapable of following you up, letting you easily pick them off one by one. Partway through the first set of Disney Worlds, Twilight Town will open up for a return visit. I headed there ASAP. Doing this segment of the plot now will give us a few very useful abilities and items for our arsenal, but that's not actually the reason I went there. The real reason is I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. In the Sandlot, you'll face a mob of nobodies, the big dangers being the Berserkers, three of which spawn simultaneously in the third wave. At low health, they start spamming the same uninterruptible attack over and over. To take them out before they got the chance, I did a transformation nearby to launch them into the air, automatically dropping their club for a reaction command. If you're fast enough, you can hit all three with one command, after which you can grab another club to repeat the combo. Once this battle is beaten, you'll unlock Limit Form. Limit Form's gimmick is four unique limit-like attacks conveniently remapped onto your customized menu. It's the only drive form that doesn't require fusion with party members, and thus can be used even when Sora fights solo. Plus, when leveled up by successfully performing limits, Limit Form grants you with Dodge Roll, Kingdom Hearts 2's equivalent of Dodge Roll. After Twilight Town, you'll also be redirected to Hollow Bastion, where, after a cutscene dump, you'll be gifted with Master Form. Master Form makes Brave Form useless and Wisdom Form highly situational, giving an awesome offensive moveset without sacrificing your magic. But, even more importantly, when leveled up by collecting Drive Bobbles, Master Form grants Air Dodge, a huge buff to our aerial maneuverability. While you're here, you may as well also get Space Paranoids out of the way, where Tron's ridiculously overpowered limit will do all the heavy lifting for you. Once that's done, get your anime butt out of there! The next big roadblock here is Demix, who will instantaneously kill you painfully and horribly. 
This happens to be one of the story battles where Mickey refuses to spawn, so dying a painful death is not a valid strategy. You'll want all the upgrades you can get to make up the difference. You can totally cheese Oogie Boogie in his fight by hopping over to another conveyor belt whenever Heartless end up on yours. The Heartless are incapable of traveling through the invisible walls, so if you're never on the same track as them, you're practically immortal. Beating Oogie Boogie grants you Magnet, which will be vital. In the Hyena boss fight, they'll always counter your attacks with a one-hit kill dash. Play it safe and sidestep after every combo. Don't worry about protecting Pumbaa. As long as you mindlessly mash the triangle button, you'll accidentally rescue him whenever he's in danger. During this visit to the Pride Lands, you'll obtain the Circle of Life, a Keyblade featuring the MP Hastra ability refilling your MP faster whenever it runs out. For the majority of the game's story, this became my main Keyblade, since most of my strats involved running around in circles waiting on the MP bar. If you're good at the game, you would probably just use ethers instead, but since I kept getting punched in the face, I preferred to use potions. In the Scar fight, Circle of Life was particularly useful since I dealt almost all damage with Simba's limit. Mindlessly run around in circles and you can dodge all his attacks, save for his mad darkness dash. For that one, instead, mindfully run around in circles. The momentum physics are weird, but if you constantly slide to the side when Scar approaches, he'll slingshot himself away from you. After a couple days worth of distractions, including some time spent grinding up air dodge and air slide, I had all the easy upgrades stacked up and was ready to get back on stage. Before heading in, just in case you weren't aware, there's a secret magic counter in the background that determines how likely you are to turn into anti-form. This counter goes down whenever you turn anti, so if it's happening constantly during boss fights when you don't want it to, transform near some Heartless. If the transformation is successful, let them murder you. Successful transformations increase the counter, but being murdered rolls back your status, including that counter, to the most recent time you entered a stable area. If the transformation was unsuccessful, Successful, congrats! Run out of the area with your counter now lowered. I should also also note I was finally forced against my will to start equipping ethers, since being bad at video games is now a less effective strategy. Whenever Demic summons Dance Waters, you can always clear them out with ease using their reaction command, available after hitting one a single time. As for fighting the man himself, I spammed Sora's Trinity Limit for the bulk of damage and in between got chunks in by countering his attacks. Though do keep your distance, at any moment he could start walking backwards towards you. Mash Triangle as fast as possible. If he gets too close, Demix will use your move and reaction command your face into oblivion. In Phase 2, he'll box you in, spawning geysers that force you to stay at a mid-distance. Keep as far as possible while still in the sweet spot. For his Arch of Geysers, this distance keeps you safe. If he instead uses the homing geysers, you can dodge roll slightly to the side of them, though I will warn that I never managed to get this down totally reliably. With some luck, I managed to get enough Trinity Limits in a row to murder water murder. But I've got bad news. Immediately after, Goofy will die a painful death, forcing you into a scripted battle sequence as Sora is controlled entirely by his unquenchable thirst for revenge. Remember how I said the continue system works? Upon continue, you reset back to the moment you most recently entered a stable area. Stable meaning an area where you aren't thrust directly into a boss battle or scripted sequence such as this one. This area began with a scripted sequence and occurred immediately after the prior area's boss battle against Demix. Since there's no stable area in between, you have to beat both Demix and this sequence of battles in one attempt. On top of that, Goofy is a dead corpse, Donald ran off on a roaring rampage, and none of the Final Fantasy characters are legally our friends. You've got to finish these fights as Sora Solo. I opened each battle with Magnet and constantly spammed the triangle button during my assault in the hopes of accidentally catching a reaction command. In between every battle, sit back and drink a latte. There's absolutely no time limit, so feel free to put the controller down until your MP refills. The Morningstar Heartless are the most dangerous and should be given priority. Also, I never actually thought of this during the attempt, but if you have some driver covers, you can use Limit Form for one free heal and offensive buff per battle, accessing the inventory to recover in between. 
In the end, I only had to beat Demix about three times before getting a truly successful attempt. Once you reunite with Mickey, Donald, and our lord and savior, Goofy Goof, you'll bank a new checkpoint. After reaction spamming through the Battle of 1000 Heartless, the mid-game plot dump will be complete, opening the second round of Disney visits. Good news is, these will mostly be uneventful. Our upgraded mobility and some liberal limit spam ensure that only a handful of boss fights provide any challenge. During the Shalden battle, when he goes invisible and spams spears, mash triangle while air dodging each volley. Reaction commanding gives stacks of the jump command to rack up tons of damage while stalling for time to use beast limit. When he summons his dragon, stick to the opposite edge, where the wind gust should completely miss you. Before fighting the Grim Reaper, swap around your customized magic. He's immortal until all coins are back in the chest, with magic and reaction commands being the only ways to make him drop them. While fire is technically most effective, it's close range and thus too dangerous to use. However, keep Sparrow in your party and he'll occasionally toss bombs that are legally fire magic, dropping a bunch of free coins along the way. When the Reaper enters vacuum mode, aim an air dodge to land directly behind his closest fireball. Even if you take a hit, you'll survive and can perform the reaction command. As for dealing actual damage, I had to face my own personal demons and admit, after two decades of firm belief, that summons do not, in fact, suck. Except Chicken Little, he's a piece of sh- Genie's Master Form Limit in particular does a huge volley of homing magic shots, making it a great all-purpose murder button. Once Death dies, Donald will obtain what just might be the most important tool in the entirety of Level 1, Flare Force, colloquially known as Duck Flare. Just you wait, Donald's gonna be toasting some serious poopsies. But for now, the next big boss is Jafar, who must be fought without party members. We are also super glued to carpet in an aerial battle, during which Jafar will constantly be throwing buildings which can kill us in one combo. To dodge, wait until just before they home in and ascend or descend at full speed. If far enough away, they'll graze past you. Normally, the two buildings are synced and predictably thrown one after another, but over the battle, they'll desync. Priority number one is despawning them. While these buildings are technically attached to the health bars on Jafar's hands, instead, punch Jafar directly in the gut. If Jafar gets a stomach ache, his hands automatically die, removing the buildings from play and leaving him open for his reaction command. Don't react immediately, though. You can min-max for a bit of extra damage before the stomach ache stops. After the reaction, you can min-max a little bit more before he eyeballs you away. Upon reaching Phase 2, the buildings will return and he'll start spamming extra attacks. It's not gonna be pretty, but get in close and reflect and you can get in a big chunk of damage, inevitably getting hit, but hopefully with enough time to escape and heal. Get in a few stomach aches and finish Jafar off, officially beating the second hardest boss in the Level 1 story. The number one hardest boss is Winnie the Friggin' Pooh. Like seriously, the, the in-game instructions don't even tell you how to play the friggin' minigame. And no, it's not because it's in Japanese. Even the English version, like, doesn't even tell you. You, you, yeah, you have to press the button w when he's facing the moon, and there's like this this whole second mechanic to the way that the, the, the gauge falls down. Like, this is the most complicated minigame in the entire game. Like, honestly, Winnie the Pooh? Probably best friends with Chicken Little. I'm glad his dad hates him. Against the experiment in Halloween Town, I dealt most damage with Jack's limit. Use both Sora and Jack's commands three times, then wait out the timer, racking up extra damage with the spin attack before unleashing the finisher. When the experiment split up, I stuck between the tentacle and the claw, reaction commanding the body between them over and over again. With its dismantling, we obtained the level one run's most iconic keyblade, Holy Pumpkin. Holy Pumpkin's grounded finishers deal bonus damage relative to the length of the combo, grading through boss health at rapid speed. I personally still kept Circle of Life equipped most of the time, but if you ask somebody good at video games, they'd tell you I'm an idiot. Speaking of the Circle of Life, our next big boss is Ground Shaker. Simba's limit is massively effective. When Ground Shaker is stunned, position yourself at just the right angle and his health bar will ludicrously rapidly decrease. When waiting for your magic to recover or Simba to revive, mash up the eyes while keeping your own eye out for the approaching geysers. Once Ground Shaker enters the final phase, play it safe. If you're out of magic or Simba is dead, stall for time by repeatedly climbing up and falling back on your face. This will keep you alive long enough until the stars align. 
You will fall directly back down on your face when Simba pathetically flails in the least correct direction and triumphantly announces his failure. Give him a couple tries, he'll get the hang of it. Against the MCP and Sark, you shouldn't have much trouble with casual strats, so there is one important pro tip. Once you enter Phase 2, Sark will start spawning walls if you try to run away from him. These walls just so happen to be a package deal with a totally free reaction command, headshotting Sark for an incredibly over-the-top, satisfying instant stun. That was the final task left in the Disney revisits. Next stop, the end game. After trouncing some nobodies, we begin one of the hardest level 1 fights in the entire story, Roxas. You'll need to have almost his entire moveset memorized to stand a chance. I say almost his entire moveset because you absolutely must not encounter his reaction command, which, when successfully countered, causes you to steal his keyblades. While triple-wielding keyblades is undeniably awesome, as far as gameplay is concerned, Roxas becomes exceptionally dangerous. Rather than bothering learning how to dodge his entire secondary moveset, you can instead simply dodge the reaction command itself. Itself. Roxas can only trigger it by charging into you. If you're too high in the air at the time, he'll give up and perform a standard attack instead. However, be warned that you're vulnerable upon landing. Upon entering Phase 2, Roxas will open with his super move, sending out a volley of homing light. To reliably dodge, unlock Roxas for full camera control and air slide in a circle while just barely hugging the wall. The proper angle will avoid every blast. His Phase 2 attacks add light pillars, usually focused directly at you. Dodge Roll and Air Slide both have some invulnerability frames, so time it just right to phase through the pillars. Once Roxas's health gets low enough to kill with one combo, don't let up. Drive into limit form and keep that combo going with one final limit. This fight will be the toughest you've yet faced, and your reward will be equally great. Roxas recompletes Sora and bestows the final drive form. In addition to generally being ridiculous awesome, Final Form comes with the Glide ability, thus completing the basic movement tutorial. After, enter battle with Zigbar, Lushard, and Sakes, all of whom are mostly just excuses to try out your full moveset. For dealing most damage, I finally started showing off Flare Force. While the fireworks show is cool and all, the really great thing about Flare Force is you're still in full control of Sora, and thus can assist Donald in lighting up some faces. With Liberal Ducks, we reach the point of no return, the door to Kingdom Hearts. Save the game now and head in for the final boss gauntlet. Similar to Kingdom Hearts 1, this point of no return is an exception to the established continue rules. Every loading screen marks a new continue point, and thus you can clear each section one at a time. As always, limits are your best friend, now performed with your literal best friend and legitimate party member, Riku. He'll help you mow through these battles one by one, effortlessly blocking Xemnas' view of the TV. The one actual legitimately difficult battle is the actual legitimate true final Xemnas. He immediately begins the battle by cutscening Sora directly into an air juggle. Genuinely trying to reaction command through is not recommended. Unless you're exceptionally quick at the draw, you'll still end up taking damage. Instead, notice the command menu is still active during the cutscene. Use this time to select Eternal Session, mashing the Confirm button to enter Immortality simultaneously with Cutscene's End, opening the battle by supermoving Xemnas' supermove. When Xemnas uses standard attacks, strafe at a medium distance and wait for him to fire his zebra lasers. He's always vulnerable to a combo immediately after. Once he switches to vanilla lasers, switch to defense, guarding until the opportunity presents itself for another eternal session. Don't worry too much about healing, Riku has his own healing spell to keep you covered. Once you start playing as Riku, take a roundabout path while firing Dark Fyriga every couple seconds. This will let you keep Xemnas' clone away and let you reach Sora with plenty of time to spare. Finally, once Xemnas uses his super duper super move, you've already won. Simply mash circle and triangle with one finger, a thing you can do in the Japanese version, and take your victory lap into the end cutscene. With Organization 13 thoroughly rejected from non-existence, the Kingdom Hearts 2 Level 1 run is mission complete. Congrats on finishing the warm-up. 
You know why you're here. It's time for the main event. The only reason anybody's watching this video and the only reason I bothered with this run in the first place. Some stupid mini games! In order to fully complete the journal, we need to do basically everything, 99% of which is identical to a casual playthrough. This includes something like 20 hours worth of mindlessly killing the same enemies over and over for synthesis material to craft items you're never even going to use. Pull up your most hated workout playlist and suffer. After a ludicrously mind numbing detour with as much progress as grind can get us, you should have all your drive forms at max level and Ultima Weapon, which, unlike the first game, is actually genuinely a decent option. Being an upgraded circle of life with a longer reach, MP Hastiga over MP Hastera, and most importantly, it looks cool. But not all stupid minigames are dumb and easy. Some are dumb and impossible. We actually won't be fully equipped to complete all the minigames or have access to all the synthesis materials we need until we start on our journey to beat the actual main event. Kingdom Hearts 2's selection of super bosses, of which there are 20. Yes, seriously, this game has 20 super bosses. If you were wondering why this video wasn't even half done after we beat the friggin' game, you've got your answer. This is honestly way past due, but to get yourself ready for these babies, you should trade in the ethers as your item of choice and swap them all out for elixirs. While not quite as good as mega elixirs, only granting full recovery to a single character rather than the whole party, vanilla elixirs are good enough for most situations and, more importantly, can be easily farmed in a short amount of time. Stuff your entire fridge with these things. Trust me, no matter how certain you are you've grinded enough, you're gonna be coming back for more. With an infinite supply of elixirs, you can stop with the boring strategy stuff and enter the first few super bosses with absolute unrelenting ham. Remember how you can still run around and do your basic moves while executing Duck Flare? One of those allowed moves is using an item. Barrage your opponent with Duck Flare, throw up an elixir, wait for Duck Flare to run out, and then hey look, my MP is full! With Sora's max inventory, eight elixirs can be brought into a single battle, more than enough to decorate any room with its occupants. Just turn your brain off and enjoy the pretty lights. This mindless spam is enough to obliterate Absent Larsheen, Absent Lucius, Absent Zeshin, Absent Veshin, and Absent Marluche with absolutely no brain thinking whatsoever. Less minimally brain thinky is the veteran super boss making his return from Kingdom Hearts 1, the one-winged angel Sephiroth. Donald and Goofy, despite being there in the intro cutscene, are totally MIA. Ducks are invalid, so we'll be relying almost entirely on basic attacks. Sephiroth will always be vulnerable after his basic combo. Stay just barely out of his attack range and counter. When he teleports away, he might appear practically anywhere and perform practically any move. Get ready to dodge roll in advance. If you fail to dodge his juggle attack, he'll try to execute you in midair, but all hope isn't lost. Wait out air recovery and to reflect with exactly the right timing and you might survive his follow-up attacks, which just so happens to set him up for your own combo simultaneously. The most dangerous post-teleport attack is his reaction command. You can only react while grounded. If he catches you in an air slide, you are dead. Dodge roll, however, is legally still grounded. If you don't need the extra distance, keep your dodges short. In a panic, the reaction command can also be survived with a well-timed reflect. Either way, upon survival, punish him. Starting in Phase 2, his basic attacks will home in more efficiently. You'll need to keep at an even further distance and take to the air if you get backed in a corner. He'll also start summoning Dark Orbs, which can be parried with Reflect. As long as Reflect touches at least one orb, the resulting explosion will launch the rest. During Phase 2, Sephiroth also begins using Heartless Angel, which, if you remember from KH1, drops you to exactly 1 HP and 0 MP. 
KH2's Heartless Angel is a blessing in disguise thanks to our improved mobility. Start a glide immediately after an air dodge to enter your max glide speed instantly and close the distance with plenty of time to spare. Hit Sephiroth just once to ground him, then use a ground combo for maximum damage. In Phase 3, his standard combo becomes absolutely too dangerous to dodge on the ground, but otherwise he's practically identical. His super duper move, despite the theatrics, is basically just a cutscene. I'm not sure I've ever even been hit by it once in my entire life. If you suffered through Sephiroth and Kingdom Hearts 1, don't worry, this downgraded loser is a total pushover. Your reward for beating him is the situational but practically required Fenrir, a Keyblade equipped with the negative combo ability decreasing your maximum combo. Against most bosses, this is a bad thing, but in a few dumb stupid minigames, it's ideal, cutting out a third of the time normally taken to unleash a finishing move. One such dumb stupid minigame is the Colosseum in the Underworld. There are four cups to get through and all four have a required goal score in the journal. Honestly, these are pretty easy, so to keep this video's runtime down, I won't be covering them. With that detour out of the way, we're heading on to the next dumb stupid minigame, the Ura Coliseum in the Underworld. There are four Ura Cups to get through, three of them simply being higher level variants of the Vanilla Cups with a higher goal score. Since we're long past the point the game scales damage, the goal scores are the only practical difference. For maximum score, equip as many prize up abilities as possible, including by equipping the Wishing Lamp Keyblade. During the Colosseum, all baubles dropped by enemies are converted into score baubles. Since prize up makes enemies drop more baubles, every instance equipped makes every instance you earn points worth more. There's also a very, very stupidly secret mechanic the game never tells you about. When you kill multiple enemies simultaneously, they'll drop better score baubles than if killed one by one. I have no idea why, but I'm gonna hazard an uneducated guess that it's because the combo meter goes up before score bobbles are dropped. That would mean if enemies are killed simultaneously, then all of them would drop score bobbles as if each individually were the final kill. Regardless of why it works, abuse of this secret mechanic is required to reach the first two goal scores. For multi-kills, abuse the Magnet Thunder combo and Trinity Limit, which delays all damage until the finishing move. For the Ura Cerebus goal score, you'll also have to beat the good boy himself under a cup-wide time limit. Standard attacks are too slow. It's time to unveil the absolute best secret technique in Kingdom Hearts 2, the Key Blender. During Final Form's glide, a hitbox is created on the spinning keyblades in front of Sora. This hitbox normally does pitiful chip damage, but if you release and repress the glide button, the hitbox will disappear and reappear, effectively dealing that chip damage once per button press. Mash that glide button while scraping against Cerberus's face to eviscerate his health bar in record time. For the Ura Titan goal score, even abuse of the secret combo mechanic isn't enough. Instead, put yourself into critical health, summon Stitch, sit back, and drink a latte. Remember how I said all baubles are converted into score baubles? Stitch's ukulele stuns all enemies and causes them to drop health baubles. And since all baubles are converted into score baubles, we get tons of free points. It's not abusable indefinitely, but it's still a huge boost to our score. Do this in the Berserker round, and in the rest of the round, summon Peter Pan. Whenever Peter Pan is active, attacked enemies drop magic baubles, granting an automatic boost to each enemy's score output. Along the way, you'll also need to not die, which I probably should have mentioned by now is hard. To keep enemies at bay, abuse both Magnaga and the Magnet Splash finisher. Unlike the unupgraded Magnet spell, Magnaga can pull enemies from a decent distance, interrupting most attacks. Magnet Splash, meanwhile, has a bit of a startup time, but can be used infinitely without magic. Magic. Once you're close to the goal score, throw Peter Pan in the trash and shift to safety strats with Genie and Stitch. Genie's limits keep you immortal while clearing out the more dangerous crowds. Stitch will automatically reflect all projectiles that near Sora, randomly block nearby attacks, and frequently lick your HUD back to max MP, allowing for near-infinite magnet spam. Once you reach Hercules, you've already won.
Welcome to the final URA exclusive URA Hades Cup. Forget about the goal score, you'll need major grit and determination just to reach the end. This cup features 50 total rounds, swapping between rule sets every 10. Don't nope out of reality just yet though, simultaneous with each rule change is a checkpoint, allowing you to restart from there upon death, albeit with your score rolled back to zero. Additionally, once the cup is beaten, every individual round becomes selectable as a starting point. With the goal score being a surprisingly small 15,000, you might think that means we can just start from, say, round 41 and spam summons to reach the goal score. One problem with that, summons are only available during rounds 1 through 20. Summon cheese is only possible if you're prepared to beat at least 30 impossibly deadly rounds in a row. But I've got a very, very astronomically stupidly ridiculously stupid backup strat. First things first, we need to beat the cup. Since we don't care about score right now, swap Wishing Lamp out for Fenrir. Negative Combo lets you unleash Magnet Splash 30% faster, reducing the amount of time you spend vulnerable. The first 30 rounds should be relatively easy with liberal use of summons and limits. Once the fireworks show is over, you'll enter round 31, running under Cerberus Cup rules. That means no party members and a time limit, with the consolation that all drive transformations are available and the drive gauge refills ridiculously fast. The gist of my strategy? Open with Magnaga and Thundaga. When out of MP, enter Final Form. Standard attacks will handle less dangerous mobs, while Magnaga can stun the rest. Once you run out of MP, manually end Final Form, smack some poor schmuck for the drive, and re-transform to refill all MP. Round 34 features two sorcerers whose attack cubes are unaffected by Magnet. Use the Final Form Key Blender to deal massive damage while pushing the sorcerers backward, thus constantly moving them away from their cubes and leaving them defenseless. Round 35 isn't dangerous, but remember we're under a time limit. For an acceptable murder rate, enter Master Form, spam Magnet and Thunder, exit Master Form, refill the drive gauge with your residual magic, re-enter Master Form, and repeat the combo fluidly. It's a lot to do in a very short period of time, but is well worth the practice, taking down the mob lightning fast. In round 40, we fight Leon and Cloud simultaneously, requiring some particularly cheesy play for a quick kill. Walk directly into their faces and reflect. If done with proper timing, both of them will be staggered. Perform this same move over and over as long as your magic lasts, which you can refill with either elixirs or a transformation. With Leon and Cloud learning what it's like to be a murder weapon, you bank the checkpoint and gain access to the final 10 rounds. These rounds have no special rules beyond the requirement that we fight solo. With the Combo Master ability equipped, you can pull enemies in with Magnet Splash by intentionally missing nearby, a way safer opening attack than your standard combo. Whittle the health bars down gradually, and don't be afraid to hang back and heal. We're not under a time limit this time. Round 47 features multiple waves of enemies. In between each wave, stall for full magic, execute the final Heartless, and preemptively Magnaga the center of the arena before the next group spawns in for an automatic stun lock. Round 48 is another battle against Cerberus. Without the time limit, you're free to hang back with baby strats, and if you're feeling particularly daring, you can reflect his reaction command for a quick kill. Round 49 is the Ura Hades Cup's true final boss. Yuffie, Cloud, Tifa, and Leon simultaneously. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, it's not as bad as it sounds. If you stick to the edge of the arena and run around in a giant circle, all four will be left behind on an endlessly fruitless quest to catch up. Just watch for Leon's Fireball, which can be dodged with the max speed glide, and Cloud's Omni Slash. The Omni Slash attacks have consistent timing and are all at ground level. Put yourself in the air just before each and he'll be incapable of landing a hit. 
Of course, in order to actually win the fight, we'll need to take a break from dodging to get some hits in. Leon's fireballs make him the priority target. When getting the job done, Thundaga is Dandaga, but Reflaga is Murdaga. Allow Leon to approach and reflect the final hit of his three-hit combo. With some luck, it will deal damage to anybody nearby. This isn't 100% safe, but in the event of a hit, you should have enough time to escape and heal. Once Leon's dead, the rest can be taken out with baby strats. Tifa is vulnerable to Thunder, Cloud is vulnerable to Blizzard, and Yuffie is vulnerable to Magnet. Magnet is unfortunately incapable of dealing the final blow, so run in close for the final combo. With the Final Fantasy crew banished to Hades, send Hades there with them to bank the Ura Hades trophy. Don't start celebrating just yet, with the Gauntlet Conquered, jump straight back in to get that 15,000 goal score. Equip Wishing Lamp and start at round 45. The magic win button cheese isn't here, but trust me, you want as much score as possible before we get there. However, I must note you should not use Round 45's reaction commands. Notice, on this demonstration, I use the laser reaction command liberally, ending with a score of cough cough 856. But when Round 46 begins, the score has mysteriously dropped to cough cough 568. Filler number two. What, wait, you weren't supposed to hear that. Something which shouldn't be possible. As far as I'm aware, losing score is not a mechanic. As for why this happens, I've got a theory. Notice, when using the laser reaction command, your displayed score will increase, even at times when a score bobble doesn't appear to have spawned. Also notice, this coincides with moments when the laser hits JPEGs of enemies in the background, rather than actual 3D enemies. It's difficult to be certain even when going frame by frame, since so much is happening on screen simultaneously. But it's my interpretation that the JPEG enemies increase the displayed score upon death, without dropping score bobbles. I suspect this only increases the score displayed in the top left of the screen, while there's a separate invisible score tracker that only increases from score bobbles, being completely unaffected by JPEGs. This would mean all the points gained from JPEGs are an illusion and don't functionally exist. When the display counter disappears and reappears between each round, it reads the secret background track score to know what number it should start at resulting in what any player would perceive as a score decrease. Truth is, you never had those points in the first place. The game just told you you did erroneously. Regardless of that tangent, I recommend playing it safe and avoiding reaction commands entirely. The idea that my score might magically drop below the goal after I pass the finish line is just too scary. Once you've reached round 47, ignore the bulky vendor because God knows it's probably cursed and take out the living bone while dealing as little damage to the Lance Soldiers as possible. Lance Soldiers, while at high HP, will always mindlessly attempt to charge you and check out what happens during the silly little wind down animation. Totally free baubles. Without Wishing Lamp, they drop one point per bonk, but with it, they drop two points per bonk. That means we'll be sitting here for roughly 7,500 bonks. I suspect you've already grabbed your latte, but sorry, this is not a true latte strat. The Lance Soldiers are technically capable of killing you, so you'll need to take your latte to go and sip it while babysitting these guys for roughly three hours. And remember, after that three hours, you'll have to risk it all by clearing the remaining rounds. Nevertheless, beating four rounds in a row is a significantly shorter order than beating 50 rounds in a row. So unless you're exceptionally good at video games, this is the time efficient strat. Once 15,000 points are in the bank, continue the battle the same as you cleared it the first time. And also, pretty please do not lose those last three hours at literally the first opportunity like some dumb stupid idiot almost did. In the Final Fantasy onslaught, the reflect strategy suddenly became terrifying. Instead, I slowly killed Leon with thunder from afar, because God knows I've got time to spare. Once they're dead, victory lap Hades directly in the face to truly complete the Ura Hades Cup, reaping your ultimate reward. Literally nothing. 
After that gauntlet, we're still not quite out of minigame hell. There still remains the army of bees in the middle of Twilight Town, who must be defeated in 10 seconds. This can be done with Magnaga, Fyraga, and the Bond of Flame Keyblade, which raises fire damage. I am legally obligated to note that in Japanese, B is Hachi, and the number 8 is Hachi. I beat the bees in a time of B point B B, the beest possible number. Buzz! The minigame final bosses are the three remaining members of Mushroom Organization 13. Mushroom 7, Mushroom 10, and Mushroom 5 each of which require special strategies on level 1. Beforehand, synthesize 4 Shade Archives for the maximum possible accessory magic boost and 4 Full Blooms for the maximum possible accessory strength boost. Additionally, for the strength setup, you should have Ultima Weapon and Fenrir equipped on Final Form, while for the magic setup, you should have Ultima Weapon and Fatal Crest equipped on Final Form. These setups result in at least 27 Strength and 27 Magic, respectively. I have no idea how the math works, and I'm literally just doing what strangers on the internet told me, but as I understand it, 27 is the baseline at which our damage outputs increase. You'll need the magic setup for Mushroom 7 in the Twilight Town tunnels. The required time to deplete their health bar is 10 seconds, which can be done by rapidly short hopping and reflecting in midair. If properly timed, you'll combo these reflects indefinitely. Once 7's health bar is low, get in a quick Thundaga and you might just barely scrape the 10 second barrier. For Mushroom 10 on Isla de Muerta and Mushroom 5 in the Cave of Wonders, you'll be using the Strength setup, which very luckily increases the strength of Blender Mode. The harder of these two and hardest mushroom in the game is Mushroom 5, who, once again, must be defeated in 10 seconds. This is only possible with simultaneous ridiculous fast mashing and careful positioning of the left analog stick to ensure you're always gliding forward without dislodging from Mushroom 5. I've heard from a reliable source that this requires 12 button presses per second to clear, which I believe because my hand hurts. With Organization Mushroom 13 satisfied, you'll be rewarded a completely useless Keyblade and a dorky hat. Which won't even be in the footage for the next 10 minutes because I'm a hack. With all dumb stupid minigames covered, we're almost at the true genuine main event. In order to reach 13 of the remaining super bosses, we'll have to traverse the game's optional dungeon, The Cavern of Remembrance, featuring multiple required battles along the way. These battles function similarly to story battles, locking you inside with transparent walls. Also similar to story battles, each of these battles is remembered as complete on your save file and won't reappear once beaten. Go all out with limits, summons, and elixirs for a cheesy clear and run back to bank your progress after each individual victory. The most difficult is a ridiculously long sequence of nobody waves immediately in front of the dungeon's final door. My strategy revolved almost entirely around Peter Pan. Since each hit on an enemy drops magic bobbles, you can kill almost all enemies with a limitless Magnaga combo. When sorcerers start appearing, you'll have to play more defensively. Get ready to let Peter's limit loose the exact moment you get into trouble. If you don't get it out fast enough, Tinkerbell will revive you, at which point you should also let loose Peter's limit in case the sorcerer is camping your spawn. If Tinkerbell has been exhausted and you're in a tough fight, switch over to Elixir-Fueled Duck Flares. Ration well, and hopefully you'll have enough ammo to blow open Heaven's Door. Welcome to Data Organization 13. Number 13, Data Roxas. With our fully unlocked mobility, particularly the air dodge glide combo, almost all attacks can now be easily dodged. The critical exception is when Roxas launches a wall of lasers immediately after his super duper light barrage. The laser wall thankfully doesn't kill you in one hit, so even if you fail, you'll have a chance to heal. Be sure you're airborne whenever Roxas approaches to prevent encounter with his reaction command, circling around the edge of the area to dodge every incoming attack. Once he starts his dash attack combo, land to the side, block the charge, and punish him. Importantly, starting from phase two, do not complete your combo. 
While most of Roxas's counterattacks can be dodged or reflected, one can kill you instantly. If you're patient, Data Roxas will just be a slightly longer version of the original fight. Number 12, Data Larsheen. Though Donald and Goofy are with us, Limit and Elixir Abuse are no longer an automatic win button, thanks to the boss's dramatically improved health bars and frequent use of immortal super moves. Larsheen will immediately begin with a Reign of Lightning. Reflect exactly two times to survive the lightning and stagger Larsheen with the explosion. After a punishing combo, summon Genie, swap him to Wisdom Form, and approach Larsheen to get a combo in after one of her attacks. Finish the combo with Genie's Limit. I discovered way too late that since Wisdom Genie's Limits only cost one drive bar, he'll give you a better damage per summon ratio than Master Form. Genie will especially help in setting up Larsheen's reaction command when she duplicates, often stunning both Larsheens. Get your own combos in between, and you'll have enough drive to keep Genie out almost the entire battle, substituting with Duck Flare once you run out. Against her super duper attack, simply glide counterclockwise, keeping an eye on her hands to figure out the electric beam starting positions. Through Genie abuse, I actually accidentally beat Larsheen without using a single elixir. Number 11, Data Marluche. The battle begins with Marluche's unique gimmick, inflicting us with a counter over our head that ticks down by one every time we're hit by Marluche's scythe. What does that counter start at, you may ask? Our current level. To make up for our incredibly short lifespan, Marluche's attacks are predictable and exploitable. He opens with explosive thorns, easily dodged by not standing still, and pools of darkness, easily dodged by not intentionally diving into them face first. Donald and Goofy are incapable of these strategies and will automatically die. Bait Marluche into attacking you, stick above or beyond his reach, and punish with a combo. After being comboed, Marluche will always counterattack with a teleporting slash, most easily survived with a preemptive reflect. In phase one, he'll always follow that up with a whirlwind. Guard through it, roll behind him, and reaction command his backside to deal some damage. If you're wondering why we don't reaction command his front side, that's a totally separate reaction command which, rather than damaging Marluche, refills our counter up to its maximum. I am not going to bother explaining why I don't care. Once Marluche enters phase two, he'll replace the whirlwind with the pools of darkness, which is even more exploitable. He can only perform the move after teleporting in the direct center of the arena, and after teleporting, he's briefly defenseless. Keep up the pressure and he'll never even summon the pools before entering phase three, at which point he'll spam multiple immortal super duper moves. Now is the time to go total duck. If Marluche enters Reaper mode, run around in circles and menu over to Duck Flare, activating it as soon as Marluche raises his scythe to invulnerability frame through and deal some damage after. If he enters Sawblade mode, keep to the far side of the arena, guard each approach, and counter with Duck until eventually Marluche's counter reaches zero. Number 10, Data Lucherd. Lucherd is too passive to pose a threat himself. The primary threat comes from the stack of cards he sends out to stalk and randomly attack you. The bigger groups can be cleared with a Magnet Thunder combo. You don't even need to do this half the time, since he often sacrifices his cards to start playing a dumb, stupid, easy minigame, setting himself up for a totally free combo. The exception is the dumbest, stupidest ultimate minigame, in which we're tasked with filling the command menu with circles. The first three I can time out just fine, but the fourth is so outlandishly fast I failed it every single time I tried, allowing Lucia to turn me into a die before promptly turning me into a die. There is, however, a secret winning strategy that gave me a 100% success rate. Close your eyes, trust in the heart of the cards, and press the button at complete random. If you truly believe in yourself, Lucerd will instantly drop to 1 HP, letting you permanently shuffle his deck. Number 9, Data Demix. Turns out Lucia doesn't have a monopoly on dumb, stupid minigames. Demix opens with a gauntlet of four dance water dances in a row. Each group of dance waters will be of a semi random size and must be killed within 30 seconds. For extra frustration, during this minigame, the reaction command is no longer available, so you'll need to find an entirely new strategy. 
For smaller groups, jump into the air and combo above Demix's head to unleash Magnet Splash, which will kill all five currently spawned Dance Waters. When a larger group shows up, land on the ground and spam Fyraga, which kills Dance Waters in one hit. Once your magic depletes, enter Wisdom Form to continue your Fyraga spam with the added bonus of Fluid Movement. If you run out of magic again, quickly exit and re-enter Wisdom to refill, and if even that isn't enough, which it won't be, tap into your Elixir Pile. After the gauntlet, the battle starts for real, and thankfully Demix is actually easier than his first encounter thanks to our buffed mobility and Demix's pitifully low attack power. Be frugal with those elixirs though, you'll want to keep them for his final desperate gauntlet of Dance Water Dances, whose fourth and final wave counts at 99. Even going as fast with Wisdom Fyraga as I could manage, in the end I had less than a second to spare. Put in one final jam session with Demix and let him know exactly where he can jam that sitar. Number 8, Data Axel. Axel begins by turning the floor into lava, gradually draining your health. Don't worry about that too much, the ground can only drain your health down to 1 HP. You won't die until you make an actual mistake. Axel's main attacks are either simple forward-facing combos or one from the rear. Frontal attacks can be guarded, and both can easily be reflected or jumped over. When Axel retreats into the flames, run around in circles while screaming in terror until you accidentally, automatically reaction command his face. If the floor is lava, a second reaction command will clear the floor and give you the chance to heal. Honestly, Axel himself is harmless, I'm more afraid of flubbing into the outer wall. Keep to grounded combos and Sora will naturally avoid the flub. Number 7, Data Sakes. Forget everything I ever said about rationing elixirs, this time we're starting the battle with an unrelenting tidal wave of ducks. Sakes' Berserk Bar begins at zero and he'll barely defend himself while charging up, giving you the opportunity to deal major free damage before the battle officially begins. Berserk Sakes is immortal until broken out through his reaction command, so he can't be waited out with Duck Flare's invulnerability. On top of that, he's immune to his reaction command while executing his super duper move, which he very much enjoys using. To react in the limited time frame, you need to be on the tail of his club before it even touches the ground, then hand it back to him ASAP. In between berserks, he'll return to being defenseless, letting you return to stuffing ducks down his throat. Once you get the hang of dodging a super duper move, this becomes a war of attrition. Number 6, Data Zession. While on Destiny Island, Zession only has one undodgeable attack, during which he becomes immortal and seals a member of your team inside the wonderful world of literature. This attack can't be waited out with Duck Flare. Zession is a total cheese and will extend the attack until the exact moment your invulnerability frames end. Early in the battle, he'll save Sora for last, so focus on murdering your friends to retranslate them back to normal. Once everybody's back, make a run for Zession. After you've done this a few times, Zession will inevitably get bored and instantly book Sora. Within the literary world, you can't deal any damage to Zession's main health bar, so instead use an instant Trinity Limit, taking out Zession's book health in one go and hopefully following up with the reaction command to escape. Your magic will almost always refill for another Trinity Limit before the next trip to Book World, and if not, you'll have enough time to throw out an elixir. Once Session starts using his Super Duper Meteor attack, Trinity Limit will no longer be a get out of library free card. Summon Peter Pan for safety, sit in the center, and do your best to survive the roulette. If you fail, Tinkerbell will grant a second life within the Burning Flames, and if you succeed, you'll deal major damage to Zession's book. When my command menu itself got booked, I found the only possible strategy was to throw my controller out the window. Turns out, due to a major oversight I couldn't possibly have seen coming, the command menu is written in a language I can't read. You probably won't have enough drive to keep Peter the entire fight, so after he leaves, substitute with Duck Flare, prepping it in the menu before the roulette begins. If you're not sure you'll make it, trigger the Duck Flare for safety, but if you're sure you're safe, cancel the duck and hit Zession with your standard attacks in the hopes of banking the reaction command. Zession will always be open to a combo after escaping Book World, and he has a shorter health bar than all other bosses. I only had to survive his Super Duper three times before finally punching this nerd directly in his open book. Number 5, Data Lucius. I personally consider Lucius the easiest of all 13 members. Early in the fight, crowd him in Time Reflex to chip off his first health bars. Even if you mess up, at low power levels he'll barely get any damage in. 
With his health shaved, transition to duck. Lucius rarely becomes invulnerable. Donald can handle the rest of the fight all on his own. Number 4. Data Veshin Veshin has two gimmicks, an infinitely reappearing shield, which must be destroyed before he can take damage, and a data-based anti-Sora, which levels up while Sora is tracked by the trailing circle. Trying to dodge Veshin, the circle, and anti-Sora, all while getting damage in myself, proved to be way too much multitasking for my pathetic brain. So instead, I abandoned the very concept of playing the game. The shield ensures elixir-fueled duck flares won't deal enough damage before you run out. You'll have to work Wisdom Form Genie in between. Hit Veshin with Genie's Limit, then with as many melee attacks as you can get away with before retreating behind Genie. All this stalling ensures your MP bar will be full by the time Genie runs out. At that point, throw out another Duck Flare, which, in addition to dealing damage, serves the dual purpose of recovering drive, thus allowing for more total Genie summons. While you do have to leave yourself vulnerable occasionally, this strat makes up for it with massive return on investment per elixir, easily lasting through Veshin's entire health bar. Number 3. Data Zaldin Zaldin is personally my pick for the hardest data fight, requiring absolute knowledge of his moveset both to stay alive and get any damage in. Open with Duck Flare to shave off Zaldin's first health bar, after which he'll cast his Arrow Shield. This shield hurts on contact and reduces all incoming damage. To get rid of it, you need to use his Reaction Command, available if nearby while he attacks. If he uses a spinning combo, jump immediately in front of him and stall with glides while mashing Triangle. I found it easiest to brain think by mashing triangle and square at the same time. That way, you don't have to bother figuring out which of the two buttons you should be mashing and which you should be holding. If he uses the charge attack instead, you can technically guard or reflect it, but this is absolutely not an option. The charge was very questionably implemented and, when blocked, may totally screw you over. Notice in this footage, I seemingly time my guard correctly, but get one hit KO'd, which is especially weird considering the charge attack is not strong enough to one hit KO. Slowing down the footage reveals the problem. Sometimes, presumably when Sora and Zaldin are in a relative sweet spot, Zaldin will approach too quickly and the arrow shield will contact Sora. The arrow shield is unblockable, so Sora takes chip damage, cancelling the guard, and then Zaldin promptly impales Sora for stupidly failing to guard. Reflect has a similar problem, sometimes successfully blocking the charge attack, but leaving Sora sitting inside the arrow shield, getting ripped to shreds the moment the Reflect ends. Long and short of it, just jump above the charge attack instead, meanwhile mashing triangle to hit the reaction command. Every successful reaction replaces the standard attack command with the stackable jump command. Jump automatically targets Zaldin, removes the shield, and provided you successfully stagger him can be comboed as long as your supply lasts. Be careful with the timing though, if you don't stagger Zaldin, he'll escape and restore his shield. And would you look at that, Sora's just sitting there inside the arrow shield. Guess he's dead! Jump will be how we deal almost all damage. The rest of your time will be spent trying to survive. When Zaldin disappears to rain spears, dodge the entire volley with a max speed glide. Though not physically present, Zaldin is still only capable of raining spears within a certain range as he invisibly follows you around. Try to get a good idea of his current attack range so you can scrape past him when necessary. For the final attack, stand in place and cast a couple reflects, keeping you safe while dealing some damage. In Phase 3, Zaldin will begin using his Super Duper move, which is very thankfully less dangerous than his standard attacks. Keep away during his spear swings and watch for which side of the bridge he rides over. Position yourself on the right side of the bridge relative to Zaldin. He'll always slide along to your position, plant in place, and fire the laser to the right, giving you an opening to escape to the opposite end where the laser can never reach. Once Zaldin is back on the bridge, he'll enter over-the-top teleportation mode, shifting towards you at rapid speeds and occasionally instantaneously attacking. This will probably feel overwhelming, but there's a logic to it you can exploit. Zaldin generally will not attack if you're too far from him before he teleports, but if you're nearby, he likely will. Use this knowledge to your advantage, baiting him into constant attacks to farm jump commands, and of course, throwing ducks in his face the exact moment Donald stops being a corpse to keep the heat on Zaldin for an incredibly satisfying KO. Number 2. Zigbar 
Though I initially had trouble and feared Zigbar could be a major roadblock, I ended up beating him on total accident while experimenting. Hence why I have Rumbling Rose equipped, which during this fight is basically useless. Zigbar's bullets are ridiculously fast, and you need to block them in order to stagger him. Attempting to block or reflect these in any reasonably fair manner isn't sustainable, especially starting in Phase 2 when he starts firing giant one-hit KO reaction bullets. Additionally, Duck Spam doesn't last anywhere near the entire fight because Zigvar is a total cheat. If he teleports away during Duck Flare, he'll just sit and wait off screen until Donald gets it out of his system. The key realization that won me the battle was that Zigbar is not only permanently airborne, but also defenseless at close range. Normally he compensates by teleporting randomly around the arena, but in the hallway and enclosed room stage layouts, Zigbar will stick within a small area, leaving himself open to the Key Blender. Not only does this shred Zigbar in no time, Final Form's ever-present hitboxes tend to block bullets automatically. Blending Zigbar's health bar closed the elixir gap, giving just barely enough time to survive the infinite headshot combo and give Zigbar a taste of his own medicine. Number 1, Data Zemnis. This consists of two battles, the first one being pathetically easy since Zemnis hardly even tries to touch you. When he does his super long spinny dinny, keep a close ear to his grunt sounds. He always makes exactly the same sequence of grunts with exactly the same timing, providing a tell for the end of the attack. He always goes, who, ha, ha, who, ha, after which he's open to attack. Upon successful reaction command, he'll drop to 1 HP instantly and let you move on to the real fight. Before we join up with Riku and get to the second battle, an important note. Given how close we are to the finish line, I decided to turn the ham dial up a bit to fill up not just my own, but also Riku's inventory. Open the battle with last session, but stall a bit before using it a second time. Every time I tried non-stop spam, I'd get caught by one of Xemnas' attacks as soon as it ended. Stalling a bit prevented that. Otherwise, mash Keyblades in Xemnas' face relentlessly. You won't need to bother learning how to survive. The exact moment Eternal Session ends, Riku will back you up with an elixir and allow for another go. Between both your stocks, Xemnas will inevitably be drained to the breaking point and use his final super duper, which, as in the main story, is just a very, very awesome victory lap. Put this hasn't been out of his misery. With the Data Organization 13 conquered, we obtain a permanent upgrade to our dinky little hat, and can finally, 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 move on to the absolute finalist task in the entire game. The inevitable sequel hook, Lingering Will. Lua is by far the most over-the-top ludicrous superboss not only in this game, but out of basically every video game. This guy doesn't punch you to death, he vaguely gestures at the idea of punching you, which is itself an automatic KO. He has a gun that fires bullets five times your size! Bullets that don't just kill you, they invalidate the entire concept of your life! Almost every single one of Lawa's attacks is a super move, granting him with immortality for their very, very long duration. To put it simply, Lawa is a player character using our strategy. To match Lawa cheese for cheese, we're going ultra mega over the top ham mode with Sora, Donald, and Goofy fully stocked with 18 total mega elixirs. Do not think that means you can just let Donald do all the work for you. We need every single one of these babies to last us as long as we can get away with. Bring out Genie's Wisdom Form at every opportunity and spam his limit until Lawa gets staggered. Lawa's weakness is his inability to end a stagger until after reaching the ground, so wait for him to land for a ground combo. Though do be careful, if you hit him too many times in a short window, he's liable to counterattack. Very importantly, do not try to dodge, just spam Genie. If Genie gets hit, the drive gauge will deplete, ultimately costing you more resources than if you'd just wasted a limit. In between summons, get out a duck flare. 
Donald and Goofy will ensure you have enough magic for it whether you like it or not, often wasting their Mega Elixirs by throwing two down your throat simultaneously. In the final phase, Lawa will begin using his ultimate Super Duper, an unrelenting barrage during which I genuinely have no idea what's happening. Just keep spamming Duck, or in an absolute emergency, spam Reflect and hope you survive. Once Donald and Goofy's elixirs are dried up, you'll have to dip into your own stash, and in the final phase, you're gonna be dropping them constantly. With this cache of firepower, Loa is still one of the harder super bosses, and I only managed to beat him after throwing down my final elixir, moments before I completely ran out of options. With Lingering Will finally meeting a vaguely equal opponent and leaving to linger in the world of Kingdom Hearts 3, which I hear is gonna be on the PSP? The Kingdom Hearts 2 Level 1 Run is a double ultimate mission complete. I am done. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Rock Band 4 next month. See you, everybody. But hold on, I'm actually not done yet. There's a little bit of a loose end, so we need a hastily cobbled together epilogue. As I'm sure many of you have been politely screaming, there are a couple well-known cheese strats that trivialize the super bosses. While I didn't ban cheese for my run, I wanted to find my own strats and beat the super bosses myself without help from external sources. So for the most part, I avoided looking up strats online. But since half the fun of VG Myths is stupid cheese, and at least a couple of you out there are gonna use this video as a guide, here's a short cheese showcase. For a huge chunk of bosses, there exists an infinite combo, and it's stupidly easy to pull off. Simply summon Peter Pan and spam two-hit aerial combos. For some reason that I'm not going to bother looking up, the boss will be incapable of performing a counterattack. Obviously, this strat isn't available in any fight that doesn't allow summons at all, and depending on the boss, it may be harder to pull off, appearing to have tighter timing windows. It's highly recommended you turn high jump off to make short hops easier. Of the super bosses who allow summons, I got this to work against Marluche, Larsheen, Demix, Zeshin, Lucius, Sakes, and Loa. The general consensus seems to be that Sakes is the easiest, so you should probably practice on him first. Additionally, I was able to get it to work against Veshin at least long enough to shave a major chunk off his health bar, but I couldn't get it consistently, and I've been told he'll eventually use his super duper regardless. At least it'll give you a head start. There's also one other cheese that can be used against Roxas. Unequip dodge roll and intentionally encounter his reaction command. Use Trinity Limit when Roxas is near a wall to stun him, and then and spam air slides. The stolen keyblades will deal a tiny amount of chip damage and prevent Roxas from escaping. I'm told unequipping dodge roll is required to make this possible, for some complicated programming reason I'm also not going to bother looking up. Basically, Roxas's counterattacks are programmed to trigger from dodge roll, but not air slide, presumably because the devs never imagined somebody would unequip it. Once his health is low, use Trinity Limit again to safely end the battle. Before heading out, very special thanks to Kingdom Hearts 2 speedrunner Zoin. She was incredibly helpful behind the scenes, including teaching me how to beat the mushrooms, which I legitimately believed were impossible when I started the run. And finally, special thanks to all Patreon backers, including Anon42, RB Drock, Solin Zero, Leslam, Chris Nate, Alexander Botkin, Ani, Akrira, Vincent Hall, Alex Nelson, Lively Leader, Jason Ilges, Vaith, Rory Kelly, Rundum Goy, Lane Robert Leishman, Liddy Kitty, Game Champ says trans rights are human rights. I'm going to change this name soon, but I'll always support you, GC. Crustacean Creep, Salty Sweet, Queen Sapphire, Plum Sweater, Yield Foreign, Hashtag EMT, and Specialist Sandra Kozak. Nathaniel Kalita, Nikki Wiki34, World Soas Game of Chess, I am not playing and haven't been paying attention. I'm just curious who's winning. Multicore, Celestial Cookie, Veravias, Curbs D50, Zo, Jorb, Damian R. Evil Game Champ is like Bad Evening Nobody and Unwelcome Forward to WH Facts, the offline on paper board game movie, Yap Alonzo, Chronosanthium, Doro25, Britface, Star Captain Eli Shaba of Clan Ghost Bear, Wispy Syrup, Riley Anderson, Arkhomes, Neptunian Baby, Slow Chess Black, YGO Video Not on YT, so repeating move, let's open up that E file, Pawn F6. What's that noise? Nova, Sinequay says hashtag Landback, Faye B, Zith Uggles, and Dragon, Eric Baron, Zero, Mars Becker, XCY, IB Mackie, Drawn by AJ, the one true AJ. Now I only want to triumph, Admiral. 
General Ampersand. Literal cat Silvy Wing Cat Girl is gay and doesn't go to bed on time. Reblog of you two are gay and or don't go to bed on time. Eve Cable. Hi, I'm Game Champ and I make my living off of reading funny names and playing video games incorrectly. Flip Chicken. Sound of Rain. Ryan Garvey. Milk Succubus. Grand Miro. Mackie B. Corporal High. Lily. Okay, this isn't funny. I need my underscore guys. Sap. I don't know what's weirder. Game of Champsan's inability to pronounce Kingu Damu Hatsutsu or Gaston not being in the game. Literally Judas. Nora Aura. DNA analysis revealed that the dire wolf is actually more closely related to African jackals than actual wolves. Attempt and wholesomeness. Beam animates. The Jellybean Warlock. Sorio 99, Jack Silverson, Dakota Riggs, Infamous Peace, Miles Edgelord, Trish Chandler, Airtide 11. Oh, Captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. Colin Monsma, Darknit, frequently a doofus, occasionally an idiot, always a fool. Idak, Carlo Calcaterra, Brisky, Margaret Josephine, Madrox 07, Maddie Serenketto. If you're seeing this, then I forgot to change my Patreon name again before the latest video. How embarrassing would that be? Doodle Sack 12, friendly reminder that it's not normal to sneeze. I have never sneezed. F. Amadon, Release Idola LP4, T. Brunelli 200, Quiet Mistrevis, Leverage, Genduro, Lemon Planter, Rob Jackson would like to inform you that this video contains themes which some viewers may find Rob Jackson-able. Epic, Awkward Silence, I Pompous, many sentences within program were of a dangerous length and were performed by trained vocal practitioners. Don't try at home. Jen the Pink Haired Cat on Twitter.com says meow. Nitsa Gamer does not recommend playing Persona 5 by doing nothing. If you do it, you'll Persona 3 yourself. Fluff System, rekindled by the heat death of the universe while waiting on Game Champ to beat Rockman 4 Damageless. Grotches, Frilly Lily, and Suverna. Sylveon underscore Superstar, hashtag 2290, Cutie Monica, Nemea, Corporate Enchantress, Tech Gek. This video has my personal seal of approval, make a seal noise. Navy ship, Ian Beck. Lanford Wilgen Eagle Gogory Schwer and Cecilio Go Go Goch. Kierka. Biohazard. That hippie gamer, BJ Mash Potato, says Sanctuary is better than simple and clean and won't be taking alternate opinions. Cody Merchant, biggest dickus. Eleven Natrium thinks that non-Polish people trying to pronounce Polish town names like Simienia Kaus are super funny. Kaiser, cow's one-handed egg cracking technique. Moomin Biscuit, trans rights are human rights. The beard phantom, everyone's favorite trans dragon girl, Aurelia. Fiona Penny Perry dot Rouge Hades Venus Judas Parker Lennox. Om Gom, my name is finally in a Game Champ video. Does this count as a haha -ha funny mean name? Notice me, senpai. Basic M, Chris, Charles Surrett. There is only one gender, it's mine and you cannot have it. STL of the Wild, non-Euclidean duct tape. Way she Linden, Bunna Wild, Ken of Red Lions. AI The Somnium Files is an action puzzle visual novel made by Spike Toonsoft and is better than Don Gun Rumpa. The non-binary Eldritch Functional QA Tester Igniology. Kirito 9979. Gameplay 4. Mystery K says Roxy Stone is a rocking gal. Getsugaru. Love Story Gaming TTV. I'm shy, but not like Shy Shy. My name's Cheyenne, but I go by Shy Shy. Krevin's 12. Twin B the Tailmeister. Complacent Moon. Amity, which among humans says watch the Owl House. It's very cool and base. Duna Thomas. Dynamaton. Seltzer Fountain Man. Madison. Asi Asi Asi. Oi Oi Oi. Scary Dinosaur. Robert Harris. Touchtone Banana Phone. Zeta is pretty and is absolutely valid and she will rise above her traumatic past. Pseudo Nim. Andrew Guinea. Lex wants Game Champ to say go watch the Owl House. 210 show of all time. It's goaded. It's gnarly. Watch it. So she spent. The enemy is in the bush. Grace Seamy. Vanelli and hi, my name is Bug. I hope you have a really good day. You deserve to. I became a patron so I could have a simple name that Game Champ can pronounce easily at the end of the videos, and that name is Woe. Tyler Beauregard, Mr. One Up Machine, Flame Solus. Macaroni Cat is supporting Game Champ with the hope that one day the Patreon credits will be longer than the video's actual topic. Tender Tyler88 supports shoveling money directly into Champ's face. Do it for her. Alexander Merrill, Morgan Autry, Locke Robin, Okatan, Chuniflo, Elliot Gulliver Needham. The Fitness Gram Tum Pacer Test is a multi stage aerobic capacity test that progressively gets more difficult as it continues. Galactic Bonesman, Awesome Games. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs too. Anna M, Smeed, Kyra Day, Wooly, but every time someone gets their pronouns wrong, they add another O and E. I'm Game Champ, and my favorite movies are The Boss Baby and The Boss Baby Family Business. They are the best movies ever made. Moon in and gay people rule. Let me know how much this video sucks and how to improve in the comments below. Your level one is stronger than you'll ever know. And get out of my house.